Welcome to the station of decapitation without your head. I'm Nasty Neal. I'm Treacherous Trista. And we're joined by the returning Maria Olson. It's very good to have you here. Hi, it's very good to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Yes, third time on the show, but first time on video on the show. Oh, Lord, help us. Yes. <laughs> So, uh, first of all, I want to say happy 88th birthday to your dad a couple days ago. Oh, thank you so much. He's actually under orders not to interrupt me right now because okay. he's about to go out to dinner with some friends. And he usually pops in to say goodbye. And I'm like, not this time. <laughs> well, very good. Hope oh. he had a good birthday. He did. He absolutely did. Yes. And he loved everybody's messages that they sent him on Facebook. So, thank you, everyone, for that. That was very cute. Is uh, how did he feel about uh, you doing uh, horror movies or even getting into acting? Oh, um, well, he's been performing since well, oh. long, you know, much longer than I have. He used to um, sing. Um, singing is not happening that much um, at the moment because pandemic and everything. Um, but he's always been a part of um, choirs or choruses or shows and that with me. We used to do a lot of live theater together um, back in South Africa. And he also used to like produce and star in his own variety shows and things like that in South Africa. So yeah, it's just been always in the family. Okay. Do you think that's what uh, started your interest in, uh, in acting and being in the theater? Perhaps. I, I can't really remember that far back because I did my first show when I was six. So uh -huh. yeah, that's a long time ago, a long time ago now. Yeah. So uh, what was that like uh, when you, I guess you don't know the difference, you know, if you're six and you're and you're doing a, a theatrical plays, uh, you don't know what it's like not to. No, I don't know what it's like not to, because um, I started dancing when I was six, my first year at school. Um, and we, we did these shows annually. And then, you know, as I grew up at school, I used to take part in the shows we did at school, the straight plays and the musicals. Then um, in college and um, after college, I just carried on with doing live plays. I've done tons of musicals, tons of straight plays, reviews, things like that. That was when I was all still back in South Africa. I only started filming that when I got to Los Angeles, about a year after I got to Los Angeles um, in 2005. So, uh, What was that culturally like to move from South Africa to L.A.? Instantly, you feel so much safer. Um, South Africa is a beautiful place with some wonderful people, but it's not safe. Um, it really isn't. And here you can just like relax and not walk around like everyone's out to get you. Um, and things were, some things were confusing and different, like um, the dates. I had no idea what date it was half the time because uh, we write our dates differently. We go small, medium, large, yeah. you know, day, month, year. It's not like that here. It's like month, day. And I'm like, wait, hold on. What is 020305? I have no idea what that is. Uh -huh. well, it's interesting you actually say that because our webmaster, uh, Andy Tyler, who's in England, uh, the first year he took care of all, all like the coding and stuff. So all the dates of the shows are in the, are in that order. So it's a, it's the year first. And then when I started taking care of that, I, so everything was the same. I, I do that, uh, to, I still do that. So. Yeah. And of course, driving on the other side of the road, that's the other big difference. It took me a long time, at least a year before I felt comfortable to drive on the freeways here as well. Cause where I come from, you know, we had one freeway of like seven, five miles long with three cars on it. <laughs> then I hit Los Angeles and it's like, <laughs> holy shit. <laughs> and <laughs> so, yeah, that was a bit um, disturbing sometimes. Yes. Uh, when you came here, when you came to L.A., uh, were your plans always like you wanted to pursue acting in, in movies? Um, that wasn't like foremost in my mind. I came here for a, a relationship, um, actually, and it just so happened that I ended up in Los Angeles. Um, obviously, I would have continued with theater. Um, I actually got into theater here like within a month or so of, of landing here. Um, about um, I did theater here for about a year. 
And then I was like, you know, I've always wanted to do film, always, always. And I've never had the chance because there was no film industry, excuse me, close to me in South Africa. So I was like, you're in Los Angeles now, like, do it, dear God, just do it. And so I did. And um, well, I've got so far and no further, let's say, because um, I've done a ton of indie stuff, but indie is not the same as studio. That's a whole different battle. Well, what are the differences besides the obvious, you know, one has more budget and stuff, but as, as an actor, what are the differences? As an actor, um, as an actor, there isn't any difference really from indie to, to, to studio because as an actor, I always brought my best to whatever character I was playing. If it was like an unpaid two liner or a role in a $90 million box blockbuster, you know, I brought my same game shall we say um there is a huge difference between film and television television is much quicker television you better know what the hell you're doing or else um there's less room for improvisation less room for trying things out um in television um but i think the main difference is accessibility um when i was doing this full time um, I could post on Facebook and active groups to say, hey, this is me. I'd love to come to name the state and do a film. And I would get, I don't know, a couple of people messaging me back or saying, hey, would you like to do this role? Would you like to do this? This sounds good for you. Studio, you can't do that. There is no line of access. Um, you have to rely on your representation. And um, I've had an interesting history with representation. Um, let's just put it that way. And um, if that doesn't work, that's it. You can't get through. And that's that's one of the things I'm, that's one of the challenges I continue to face right now. So yeah. Along those lines, would you have any advice for people like something to look out for if they're, if they're uh, wanting to get representation? Uh, that's difficult because I never had a search for it. Um, I was always of the opinion that it'll come when the time is right. So I didn't send my resume out to a hundred agents and say, please take me. Um, I just, um, I was lucky that my first agent, um, she, Bonnie Howard, who was amazing. She is retired since retired. Um, she was opening a character division. And she just happened to go through the people seeking representation on LA casting. And I was one of them that she found. And she was like, yes, absolutely come in. I will in interview you for both um, theatrical and commercial um, character division. And she signed me across the board for both of them, like as when I interviewed. So she found me, I didn't have to look. So that was awesome. Yeah. Yeah, I noticed you have a Facebook group uh, to help people out for, you know, who are looking for roles, the Monster Shares Edition group. Yes. Um, that is, prob that and the couple of amazing film groups I belong to is probably the only reason I'm staying on Facebook. Um, I'm a little bit over people arguing about, oh, the train to Busan should not be remade, or I hate this Marvel movie, or whatever the hell people are whining about today. So I created the Monster Shares Editions to try and help people, um, help them get work. And um, I used to share a lot more auditions, but at the moment, due to the situation in the country, I'm sharing paying jobs so that people can get a chance to get paid because we, the industry shut down basically for a year um, and people need to start earning again. Um, and also I'm sharing... Most of the stuff I'm sharing um, are um, productions that comply with COVID guidelines. So it's not just come to my garage with these 800 other people and, you know, be a zombie for no pay and here's a piece of pizza. No, that's like, A, pay your fucking actors and B, that's unsafe. So I want to share job opportunities where people can get paid and they have a reasonable chance of not catching this horrible disease. Mm -hmm. um because of testing so that's my one of my main goals on facebook these days i have someone who 
who um, posts on my fan page. I don't even do that anymore um, because A, I have no time and B, that's not my main thrust. Um, my, what's the word? My understanding of the studio versus indie situation has caused me to change my thrust a little bit. I've been in about 130 indie films and I love the indie filmmakers, but personally for my career, I don't need indie film number 131. Although there are still people I would love to work with and projects I would love to do. I'm trying to get, I'm trying to do something else now, which means you don't see Vera Farmiga or Sarah Paulson or somebody like that posting on Facebook. Hey, here's my fan page. Please like my picture. Yes, I will when I have something coming out, but that's not my main thrust anymore. I'm trying to work with my agent to get me to places where I haven't been yet. And that's challenging. Well, uh, along those lines, what are, th what are, what is, what do you look for in a role? If something was offered to you, so you said you don't want to just do the number mm -hmm. 31. What, what is something you would like to do? Um, I, I look for something new. Um, I've done a lot of roles. I've done a lot of characters. And if I play the same thing over and over again, um, it can be fun, but it does get boring, shall I say? Um, I don't want to keep on playing the same thing over and over again. I look for complexity. I look for newness. I look for something that grabs my imagination. Um, because of who I am, I love playing roles that are very complex with very deep emotions. I look for that. Um, you know, come be a zombie was fun 10 years ago, but it's not anymore. Now I want to play the, I don't know, um, like I spit on your grave deja vu, the woman who was doing horrible things, but to her for the right reasons. And my challenge there is to get everyone to agree with me and not with Jennifer Hills. Um, those are the kind of things that I like, the things that I can really get involved with and sink my teeth into. And um, I had a wonderful role. Well, I have a wonderful role in the sequel to Blind. Um, I don't know if you've seen Blind. If you haven't, yeah. run, don't walk. Yeah. Um, and I was incredibly lucky to be invited into the sequel, which I can now talk a little bit about. Not a lot. Um, but I had a wonderful role there. Um, deep and layered and emotional and wonderful you know um that i loved that kind of thing i loved you know um but no i don't want to play zombie number 682 again thank you though <laughs> well tristan and i are you know uh friends with a lot of the people involved in uh in pretty boy the, the sequel to blind marcel waltz and sarah yeah. and joe netter uh, had yeah. you worked with them before like how did you know them i'd worked with sarah very very briefly on a film directed by Tom Haley um, that is still in post. Um, Marcel and Joe, I had met at the Blind premiere because I was there and I was completely fucking blown away by Blind. I hope I can swear because I'm going to yeah, do that yeah. anyway. It's Thank too late. You. If okay. You can, yeah. okay. It's <laughs> way too late. <laughs> um, completely blown away by Blind. And I told them that. Um, and I was like, I would love to work with you guys in the future, people who can create something like Blind, because just watching Sarah in Blind, you get to live what her character is going through with her. And that's the thing. You need to be able to take people on this ride. Well, for me, anyway, this emotional, heartfelt ride with you. I don't want to see, well... I enjoy the slasher in the wood genre, just like everyone else does, because I love horror. Um, but it's not my go-to horror. The psychological, intelligent art horror is what I really enjoy, like the new and the old, Suspiria, for instance. But Blind, you were with Sarah. I was with Sarah every step of the way. She was fucking amazing. And I was just like, if this is the kind of stuff that you guys make, I want to be there somehow. So I was overjoyed when one day I got the message on Facebook from Marcel. So, hi, we're doing this. You maybe want to do this with us. And I was like, yes. So that's the kind of thing I want to do, you know? Mm -hmm. I said, you said you could talk a little bit about it. I know you can't go too much into it, but can you give us an idea of what kind of character you play? 
Troubled. Troubled. Excellent. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> well, we don't want to know too much either. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, Trista, do you have a question? Sorry to take all the questions. No, it's okay. I'd love to know what some of your favorite horror films are. My favorite horror films. I like strange things. Okay. I like Metropolis. I mean, that's a sci-fi horror. Yeah. And that's from like 100 years back. But still, I like The Lovely Bones. Um, I see that as a horror movie, actually. I see that as terrifying. A terrifying commentary on what can happen um, in our society. That film made a huge impression on me. Um, I, I can watch up to 11 or 12 horror films a week sometimes. And it's difficult to keep them separate in my head because a lot of them are very formulaic and very the same. Um, I love supernatural thrillers, I think, on my, on my favorite genre within horror. Um, because they tend to be more cerebral, like the others with Nicole Kidman, um, things like that. I also love very beautiful and some visually sumptuous films like um, Bram Stoker's Dracula or Interview with the Vampire, um, films that are so very rich visually, you know. Um, I also love horror comedy. I mean, Zombievers is amazing. If you haven't seen that one yet, go for it. <laughs> metropolis and zombievers that's that's quite a, a double feature I, yeah. it's 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 a wide wide yeah. ranging love of horror <laughs> that's a good thing about horror though because i'm the same way i mean i like a lot of classics but i also like mm -hmm. something very silly it, you know it depends what kind of mood you're in exactly but you know i would steer clear away from like jason versus freddy part 13 or something because i'm like i've seen this so many times it's the same thing people getting killed with whatever, you know? Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, I love um, the, oh dear God, I'm blanking on it. Pin, pin, uh, Pinhead and... Hellraiser. Hellraiser. Yeah. Hellraiser. I, I, I love Hellraiser. That's different. That's a, until you get to some of the sequels, I, th I think part three is more where it's more of like a slasher movie. But uh, before that, they're, they're, they're not really slasher movies. Okay, now Hellraiser. Mm-hmm. I like the first one. It's absolute golden classic, right? Mm -hmm. Second and third, where it goes into camp, like, I'm your doctor or whatever the hell that was. Thank you, but no. Hellraiser to me is not camp. Hellraiser to me should be terrifying. Mm -hmm. Weird mindfuck films like they are in like the seventh, eighth, and ninth sequel. If you get that far, most people give up before they ever hit those films, and they shouldn't because they're amazing. I, I thought the, the latest one was one of the better sequels. Have I seen the latest one? Bring it to my mind. What was the premise there? Was um, that... So it's a different guy plays Pinhead. Uh, no, not, refuse not to see guy. it. Refuse to see it. Sorry, sorry. I, I, <laughs> I recommend it though, because the first one with the different guy is not good. This, this next one is, and uh, it's it's very strange. It's definitely okay. stranger ones, and there's different characters. There's like a, he's almost like the like the secretary of hell there's a character it's a very strange movie and i would recommend okay it. yeah i like strange films and that's actually one of my life goals is to become a cenobite at some point i'd love to play a cenobite love to yeah i could definitely see that do you have a favorite cenobite from any of the movies um i don't know the names i forget the names but the woman i i think she was the one who had the throat open mm -hmm. i think that's just the a one. female cenobite in uh, Barbie Wilde and friends with uh, they said that on set they called her Deep Throat. There you and go. It's just, it's yes. just called a female in the <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, that, that's pretty. That's a. They're all great, really. But yeah, absolutely. Well, except for the one where he's got like uh, laser discs or like CDs out of his head in part three. I'm not <laughs> not too big on that. Yeah, either. part three is yeah. Okay, let's yeah move on now. <laughs> <laughs> It was interesting when we had Doug Bradley on. He said some of the some of the sequels were originally like other horror movies that were just like scripts that were just laying around, mm -hmm. and then they just like kind of shoehorn uh, Pinhead in and in them to make them a Hellraiser film. You can actually see that um, because they function very well without the, the 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 sort of like parenthesis of the Cenobites, but it it's also um, 
I enjoyed the appearances of the Cenobites because it's like, okay, here's another, you know, random whatever serial killer bullshit that we're involved with and we caused it and somehow we're in there. I I do enjoy that. It's like they're like this puppet thing, Mm -hmm. you know, that causes horrible things here to happen. I enjoy that. Yeah, there's one I it was kind of a story like that that I really like. It's he's like a he's like a, a detective. Yes. And I actually think that's one of the better sequels too. I and mean, it's yes, not one agreed. that people really talk about. I it's I don't know no, if it's five or six, but it's something like yeah, that. Yeah, they don't get there. They give up on the franchise before they get to those. You know? And then they shouldn't. I, I was just like, I'm watching everything. Ha. <laughs> yeah. Uh Trista, do you have a question? Yes, I know that you knit. I'm wondering if you can talk about where people can get your blankets. Oh, my blankets? Um, I have a an order for 10 of them that I'm working on again this year. So it's going to be a long time before I look at blankets. But I have a um, an Etsy store called um, Cat Cat Creations where people can get my scarves. So I have about 20 or 30 scarves up there if they want scarves. You know, What's but- it called again? Cat, cat, meow, cat, cat. Oh. <laughs> this will be very yeah. happy with the title. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a lot of cats? I had once. Once upon a time, we had um, twenty-three. Yeah, because oh, wow. I brought twenty-one with me from South Africa. But that was wow. six years ago now. Yeah. So the whole plane was just you and kitty cat. <laughs> Um, something like that. I had a charter of flight to get them from East London to Johannesburg, and then they just, you know, got a normal flight to Los Angeles. I think they stopped over in Frankfurt or something. Um, but a pet very courier well, company, yeah, very well. Uh, a pet pet courier company did all that for me, so I I just paid them a whole bunch of money, and they did all that for me. Yeah. I love it. Uh, yeah. were, were horror movies accessible in in South Africa? Like, oh yeah, absolutely. I remember watching um, Haunted House of Horror when I was like six at the 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 movie house. Um, we only I remember a time before television in South Africa. That's how old I am. Yes. Uh, <laughs> um, so I wouldn't say horror movies was like one of the first things they put up on TV because it was all like family friendly stuff. But it eventually got there. Also, we had um, videos. We literally had video stores, just like everywhere else, and obviously the movies. So most things came through. A lot of things didn't. Um, A lot of things that are everyday, normal, accessible pop culture here did not come through to the US, uh, uh, South Africa. I've never watched, I don't know, Gilligan's Island. I've never seen that. I've never seen I Love Lucy. Um, a lot of things did not come through, but Dark Shadows came through in book and comic form, not the show. Um, so when I got here, I knew all about Dark Shadows, and now I'm catching up watching the show, you know. Um, so some things came through and other things didn't. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, did you have names for, I assume you had names for all the cats, but when you have 21, 23 cats, how, how, do, you, uh, how do you remember all their names? If you had 23 children, would you remember their names? <laughs> I would, yeah. I thought I had a lot of cats. I had eight cats at one point, but 23 is, is impressive. Yeah, yeah. Yes, I, I used to be able to recognize their, their meows in the dark, as in like, you know, Louise, keep it down. <laughs> <laughs> Do the scars have cats on? Do the what? Oh, the scarves. Yeah. No, no, they haven't. Um, but if you look at the pictures that I posted on my Etsy store, you'll see that everyone has a little cat figurine. And so, yes. I'm going to look these up then. After the- <laughs> so I noticed you have a lot of producing credits. Um, would you ever be interested in uh, writing or directing a movie? If I had time and if I had the money, absolutely. Um, it takes a lot of time and a lot of money to produce. Um and it's not something that's a a goal that you can reach easily or quickly. Um, so my writing, um, I've put aside because it's really like, okay, fine, I'll take X amount of hours to finish the script and then what? Nothing ever will happen with it. 
Um, I helped people shop scripts at one point, so I know how hard it is to even get a production, an established production company to read them, to to look at your email, never mind to produce your film. So I was like, that's awesome. I love writing scripts, but it's not going to get you anywhere, so concentrate on something else that is. Um, and producing, I used to love to producing, but again, it takes money and time and don't have much of either because I have other commitments. <laughs> so although I'd love to get back to that, I don't think I'm going to be able to. Yeah. So uh, you said you were singing, you know, at six. Um, wh when did when did acting become like the, the part you liked the most? I think sometime in high school. Um, or maybe in college or just after college, um, I did um, a production of Fiddler on the Roof um, the year after I left college, I think, or high school, one of the two. Um, and I got the role, I don't know if you know the story of Fiddler on the Roof, I got the role of the third daughter, which is like the most emotional role in the musical. And like every night I would have to be in tears on stage and whatever, because it's a super emotional role. And I was like, look, look at this. I can do this. Hmm. So I think, you know, from then on, I concentrated more on the acting side, but um, a lot of the things that we did in South Africa with the two dramatic societies that I was a part of were musicals because people came to see musicals. They didn't really come to see straight plays that much. So a lot of the stuff that I did ended up being musicals. Um, when I got here, I did a, a bunch of plays. Um, and then I started getting into film. I started auditioning for film and like not getting anywhere, not getting anywhere, not getting anywhere. And then because the styles are different, um, theater and, and um, film acting, very different. And you need to figure that out first um, for yourself first. Um, and then I remember the very first project that I booked, I clicked into emotions. I clicked into being able to cry and cue in that audition. And that was the first one I ever booked. I mean, then I was like, huh, okay. So that's how you do it. And look, I'm booking all these horror projects. So, oh yeah, I'm very intense on screen. So you love horror and you're intense on screen and the two go together. So why not go out for more horror projects? Which is what I did, which is what I kept on booking. So, and that's, it's, it, it's a voyage of self-discovery all the time. And you have to figure out who you are before you can figure out who you play. And not who you are in real life, but who you are on screen different what was it about horror movies that, that made you want to pursue those they you have you can have fun and you can have super intense characters you can get away with playing the really super intense stuff where you cannot in dramas or anything like that i mean look at piper laurie as carrie's as um carrie's mom and carrie perfect for the role perfect for the film You'll never see anything like that in a normal drama. Never. It just doesn't belong there because people don't act like that. Well, we hope they don't in real life, you know. Um, but it's that kind of thing that I want to play. And you, if I go out for rom-coms, I just won't book it because I'm not the right type. And they don't have the characters that I can play well. Because it's not just can I play it. It's can I play it well? Because even if I can play it, there's 20 more people who will play it well. You know, so you look, find what you can do best and then try. Uh, when you talked earlier about your role in I Spent on a Grave Deja Vu and, uh, you know, it's a villain. And you said your, your uh, take on that was to try to get the audience to see your side, you know, as the villain. Uh, was that? in the script or is that something you add to the, to the character, you know, when you're taking on the role? Oh no, even for me, even in the auditions, that was obvious to me. She was always just a normal woman put under abnormal circumstances and reacting to those abnormal circumstances in ways that she feels is the only way open for her. You know, she's not mentally ill. She's not, I don't know, um, Death Wish. 
there's something else. Um, Charles Bronson goes ape over people who kill his family. Okay, but he's put up as the hero. I go ape over someone who kills my husband, and I'm suddenly the villain. It's right. just a difference it, of perception. It's similar idea to the first movie where she gets revenge on the people that that did her harm, and now you know it's kind of the cycle of violence. It's a cycle. It's a continuous cycle. Even the ending. I don't know if you've seen. You guys have yeah. seen it. Yeah. Right. When um, my kids come, they've arrived back for spring break or whatever it was, and they're about to walk into a whole lot of shit where their almost entire family is now dead. And how are they going to react to it? How are they going to react to their new half sister? Mm-hmm. You know, what's going to happen? You know, is it just going to continue? Or are they all going to suddenly be happy families? <laughs> no. <laughs> you know, so it, it continues. Yeah. And I saw that it was up. It's up for an award. Uh, best, um, I think, box set. Independent box yeah. set. Yeah. A couple of awards, actually. So let's hope that something good comes out of that. Yeah. Uh, Tris, do you have another question? Yeah, Neil asked earlier about advice regarding representation, but outside of that, do you have any other advice for aspiring creators? Um, The advice that I usually give, I think I'll give again. If it's something that you think you might like to do, it could be fun. Don't do it. It's not for you. It's a hard and a frustrating and a sometimes disappointing life. If it's something that you cannot live without doing, then absolutely give it your best shot. That's pretty much it. I'll be honest, that sounds very similar to uh, the first time we had Trist on and uh, when we asked (laughs) her about, uh, before she was a a co-host here, when she was a guest and about why she pursued acting. It's a very similar uh, story. Yeah. I, I assume you see a lot of people like that, though, who do pursue acting, who you who don't really love it. Um, yeah, because they pursue it for different reasons. Like, I want to be famous. I want to be on TV. But that's not it. Um, although, yes, I would like my career to advance to a place where I am on TV but it's not to be on TV. It's to be a part of the shows I love and admire on TV. Okay. Um, but if, but I, I love acting. I love becoming, I love playing with emotions. I love manipulating people's emotions as they watch me. I love bringing truth to a role and I can sometimes get that satisfaction just from an audition. You know, um, it doesn't have to be, on TV or in a blockbuster, I can audition for a role and I'm not wrong for it, but I'm not a hundred percent what they had in mind either. So I don't book it, but the audition process for me is so fulfilling because I get to go through all those steps and just, I don't know, it's difficult to explain. Um, It's doing your favorite thing in the world. And if you get a chance to do it, you don't, it doesn't matter where you're doing it. You know, like a friend of mine, she's a really, really, really good singer. And I read her Instagram post today. Oh, I'm recording all of these songs. No, not because I'm involved with anything to do with music right now, just because it makes my heart sing. That's exactly it. Doing what you love makes your heart sing. It doesn't matter where you do it. Um, Just when you're talking about the audition part, I don't know if there's any similarities to the theater where you have the the uh the immediate reaction from an audience where it's the people watching the audition if that would be different than you you film a movie and you don't know people's reaction until you actually see it with uh with an audience oh you mean the actual performance not 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 an audition okay well Um, you you said that the audition you like too and i was wondering if there's a similarity between that and performing on a theater where you have the immediate uh reaction from someone um for a lot of auditions, you never get reactions. Okay. okay. So it's a personal. I've been once, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you have for commercials, especially you have the production team. They're sitting eating their lunch. Um, they, it's like you're not in the room. 
and you know next minute you get oh they loved you they want to see you again or you're on a veil they adored you and i'm like what all they did was eat their sushi how did they even see me but okay um but no you don't generally get reactions in an audition room it's like thank you next or can you try it this way or okay next whatever you know um you, you don't get reactions if it's a film or a theater audition you know theater um if you're doing it right you go up on stage and do your thing um I don't believe in film auditions in a theater, by the way, because if you have film auditions in a theater, theater actors instincts will kick in and they'll give you a theatrical performance, which is wrong for film. Just some free audition advice for people who are thinking of auditioning um, because the theater person will get on stage and they'll play to the back row. Okay. And that's not something that should ever happen on film. Um, film is private and personal and internal theater is public very different styles um but no you don't you don't get feedback you know it's like all these people i read oh i just had my audition now the waiting starts no 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 just move forward to the next one to the next opportunity you don't think about what you just come out of you did your best well you should have done your fucking best did you learn your lines did you get the emotional arc of the scene down pat did you know what you were doing okay if you did then you've done your best and move on the decision is out of your hands completely out of your hands move on to the next um but in a performance especially comedy theater your mind is continually assessing what the audience is giving you back and continually adjusting your performance okay um like I say a line and it's supposed to be followed up by a couple more, but the audience finds this incredibly funny and they laugh. So you have to hold for them. You have to realize when their laughter is dropping so that you can move on without them completely losing the feeling or, oh, they didn't laugh. So I'm not going to stand here like a fool and wait for laughter. I'm just going to go on tonight. So you're continually assessing what's coming back at you, especially comedy, especially fast, where it's quick. And um, you have to adjust what you're doing. Film, of course, nothing like that. It's like you're alone with your scene partner or whatever the hell you're doing within the scene. Um, I'm very aware of where the camera is. So it's not a ma matter of I'm just performing in like a room you know, my head or whatever. I'm very aware of where it is, not to the point, obviously, would I look at it, but I, I will play to it all the time because I know where it is. But again, that's assessing something that's happening and adjusting your performance for it. But again, it's private and personal and subdued and intimate on camera, whereas on stage, it's open and public and you share with everybody around you i don't know it's just two very different media and you know it's dealt with in two very different ways i mean there are examples of amazing actresses who cannot cross from one to the other like elizabeth taylor one of our most amazing film actresses she did do broadway but she couldn't successfully cross it was always wait we can't hear you wait wh what you know so she was so used to film that she didn't know stage I was so used to stage at one point that I didn't know what the fuck I was doing when I auditioned for film people used to say oh you're a stage actor aren't you and I was like yeah thinking that that was a compliment but it actually wasn't it's like oh you really suck because you don't know how to fine tune your performance and then I eventually figured it out you know anyway my two cents i'm just rambling no it makes perfect sense and it's a very strange thing i was about to, i'm about to say but i interview a lot of uh professional wrestlers and it's very actually similar to what they say about wrestling in a stadium as opposed to wrestling on tv because oh, yeah. you play to the back of the stadium so you do big movements on tv mm -hmm. a lot of uh, facial expressions yeah yeah exactly yeah but i love theater i love theater i really do i miss it so much 
Um, the last time I did something um, was, oh, God, how many years now? Four or five? I played, I was lucky enough to play Mrs. Kendall in a production of um, The Elephant Man. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's one of the most amazing roles ever, ever. It was a dream role of mine for a long time. And I was so lucky to be able to do that. It's a beautiful, beautiful role. Um, do um, musicals ever come up for you? you know? No, no, not in Los Angeles. I'm not competitive singing-wise in Los Angeles. You've got fucking amazing singers here. I, I No, I don't even have a chance. In East London, I was lucky to get into some of them because my acting strength pulled me in, even though I couldn't sing that well. Wouldn't happen here. Here you have the triple threads. Uh, Tristan, do you have a question? Maria, you have such a huge body of work. I have not seen everything, but I, I've seen a good portion of your work. And one thing that really struck me, um, besides your acting chops, is you have such a... Um, distinctive a lilted voice mm -hmm. and I find that a lot of people especially a lot of people that come to the states but a lot of people in general uh that work in film wind up having to like homogenize their voice and I've got a somewhat distinctive voice so I have some um experience w with having to modify my voice so anyway my question is about your voice uh, I uh, I love your voice. I feel like it. Um, I love see hearing uh, your voice in all different sorts of characters, but still knowing it's you. And I'm wondering if you do voice work or if you've had to um, fight uh, for your voice in any way. That's a very interesting question. Um, I would love to do more voiceover, but I probably never will because I will never lose. I will never fully lose my South African accent. So if it's got to be an American voiceover, I will never get it because there's always something off about me. Um, not off in a bad way, just off in a different way. You know, um, for, my experiences can range from, have ranged from the very, very good, as in um, when I auditioned for a film, one of my first called Diner, get it? Um, yes, it had the get it. It was D-I-E-N-E-R, oh, get it? Um, my my accent was still pretty strong then, and I auditioned and didn't hear whatever. And then the director, Patrick Horvath, came back to me a couple months later to say, hey, I've rewritten this entire role to make you South African. And I was like, wow, that is so amazing. And I had this like huge five-page monologue in the beginning of the, of the film. And that was all like written just for me, which was awesome. And then I've walked into auditions and it was like, I've done the audition in my best American accent, prepared it and everything. And then they'll say to me, so can you do an American accent? And I'm like, uh, <laughs> la la la. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then I, I uh, shot several films with Charles Band actually. And um, when I was shooting Trophy Heads, it was at the, rap party when he said to me wait wait you have a different accent wait you're not american and i'm like no <laughs> and i'm like that's awesome it didn't come through once yes because there i had to play a, a family member of someone who was american and that's always difficult because i'm always going to be a little bit off you know but maybe not not in trophy heads so it's um it's been a positive and a negative I played a wonderful role in a film called um, African Gothic because I was South African and I played it in Afrikaans, which is my second language. Um, if that film ever gets distribution, you know, we can all see that. Um, and I've lost a role, a wonderful role in a project about um, Jim Jones and the, um, the, the cult um, because I couldn't get the right accent. You know, so it's positive and negative. But I'm never going to be 100%. And um, my my rhythms of my speech will always be different. Always be slightly different. Because I don't know, I think things in a different way. Or I'll pick up on a different accent to the word. Or I'll have a different understanding of a line. But it will never be exactly the same as everyone else. Because I'll always be a bit different. 
I call it like my William Shatner effect. You know, it's like the pauses are in a different place or something. And sometimes I do that on purpose um, to because it's a little bit weird. Um, when I was in um, when I was doing a lot of theater with uh, Zombie Joe's Underground Theater in L.A., I would use that technique a lot and also different inflections in my voice when it wasn't the right place for them. Like we all do the, okay, my inflection goes down at the end of a sentence. Otherwise it's the end of a sentence. It's a question, but I would swap out inflections just to be weird or different. And that works sometimes in horror movies. So yeah, I'm conscious of what I do a lot, but also a lot of my speech, my rhythms of my speech just come as they come. I don't spend time practicing how to say a line or anything like that. I'd rather get the emotion underneath the line right in my head, and then the line comes out as it is supposed to be. I don't know. That's just how I do it. Interesting. Uh, so this, the last year has been a strange year for everybody. Uh, what's this last year been for like for you? Uh, what have you been doing? Oh, I've been working in an office. Um, I shot a feature and a short film in February 2020. Um, I traveled to Colorado to shoot the feature and then shot the short film here in L.A. Then everything shut down. Okay. Um, and pretty much I didn't shoot again until October because COVID-19, you know. Also, I didn't really want to um, take the risk and shoot something out there somewhere um, because my dad is 88. So he was like in the crosshairs of this damn disease, you know? Um, so whatever, even if I did shoot in like April, November, April, April, in October, November last year, I would quarantine somewhere before I came home to make damn sure I didn't catch whatever it was, you know? Um, but I, I've only shot four projects. Um, I did two commercials and two features since October. I haven't, have I shot at all this year? I don't think so. Because no, I'm, I'm not vaccinated. I'm not flying around the countryside with hundreds of people in the tin can in the sky right now. Thank you very much. You know, um, I'd rather just wait till things are safe again, really. Yeah. I mean, if my if my agent sends me on auditions, it'll be for, you know, like top ranking commercials or um, films or series that actually have COVID guidelines and what not in place. So I'm working with her right now. You know, I'm not like running to any indie film that I see because while I love filming, it's not worth it during a pandemic. It's like not so i've spent most of my time i never stopped working i was one of the lucky ones who kept working um even after our uh the place i used to be when we shut down in march after la shut down i was the only employee that they kept on and i worked from home um so i sort of like ran everything from my laptop um and then i was the one to go back first but it was just me to get some orders out or whatever you know Mm -hmm. um so i pretty much haven't stopped working throughout the entire year i've i've been incredibly lucky so yeah, yeah i noticed on facebook you're asking for a new series to watch have you have you uh found any or well, any I, stand out this last year um i started after i after i asked i was like you're dumb you know what to watch so i chose lovecraft country okay as my next watch and my god was i blown away by that by that series i just finished it on friday um i i knit while i watch so mm -hmm. i need to have a, a a lot of shit to watch all the time um lovecraft country was or lovecraft country um was an incredibly difficult watch um and a very necessary watch and a very exciting watch if that's the kind of if that's the caliber of stuff we're going to be seeing from Jordan Peele and his band, shall we say, of filmmakers who are, you know, starting on the new era, 
Yeah. I mean, I want to see the new Candyman. I cannot wait yeah. to see the new yeah, Candyman. I, I, I love the old Candyman, but I want to see the new one. You know, and Lovecraft Country Country was amazing. Oh my God, it was amazing in a lot of ways. Acting was superb. Um, the 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 character arcs were 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 awesome. You know, um, so I really really love that. Um, what else do I want to see? I think I might try Ratched again. I didn't really enjoy Ratched the first time around, but I'm going to give it another go, possibly. Um, I do and I don't want to see The Handmaid's Tale because I think I might get very frustrated and angry with it. Um, because this is this is something that has come up recently in watching films I see as I said I see a lot of horror and a lot of horror is about people who think they are entitled to do anything they want to play out their fantasies no matter what other people's rights might be and I'm getting very very tired and very very angry of that with about that I think people I think I was actually just thinking today that one of the main issues with our society today is unbridled sense of entitlement as in I'm do that I can have that I am going to take that and we're talking from I don't know a stick of gum at the corner store to somebody's life or freedom and that needs to stop and yes we've got all serious all of a sudden but that is possibly why I don't want to watch A Handmaid's Tale because a lot of things there for what I've been seeing have been taken away from people by other people who think they are entitled to do so. And I don't really want to reach that level of anger at something right now. I just want to watch things that are engaging and interesting and yes, female centric because I can identify with that better, but I don't want to get angry about things that I have no control over and that I know should be better within our country and within the world, because um, this is somehow a way that I prepare my role for my roles as well. I find my way into my characters' minds and I open my emotions and my empathy to what's going on with them. And when I allow myself to do that with what's going on in the world around us, I get very overwhelmed and very frustrated because I cannot do anything about it. Like animal abuse, for instance, or I'd, I don't know, name your abuse, whatever the flavor of the month is. Um, what has happened in Georgia over the last few days. I cannot deal with that level of entitlement and oppression. So I just tend to shut down because I want to be Supergirl. I want to go out there and save the world and fix everything. But none of us can. Uh, Tristan, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Sure. Yeah. Uh, Tristan, do you have another question? That was a great answer. Well, Maria, as someone who has seen a lot of your work, uh, I don't want you to get angry either. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice of you. So I'm going to segue, um, although I do uh, relate and agree to what you're saying and appreciate it very much. Um, as you mentioned earlier, you were interested in playing a Cenobite. I'm wondering if you have a lot of experience with prosthetics. Oh, God, yes. Oh, my gosh. Um, the longest I've ever sat in a makeup chair to get made up for something was um, eight hours. We started like really early in the morning um prosthetics and finger extensions and wigs and ball caps and contact lenses and everything um painted on me once it got on me um finished we shot for 40 minutes golden hour time then i got back into the chair for five hours to have it taken off that was my day um i've had three life casts done maybe four. I've worn so many kinds of um, effects lenses that I own several pairs and I just bring them out with me whenever I need them. 
and because I've worn my own contact lenses since I was like 16 or something, I can put my fixed lenses in and take them out, which is really helpful. Um, oh God, prosthetic teeth that never stay in. Um, <laughs> wigs, which I absolutely hate. I hate wearing wigs, but sometimes you have to. Um, you name it, finger extensions, um, so that that time that took that took us eight hours, they gave me goat pupil contact lenses. Now, I, goat pupils, as not many people know, are um, rectangular. They're not round, okay? And they only stay on one plane. I forget if it's that plane or that plane. But whatever, I have an astigmatism. So whenever they put the contact lens in me, it was like drifting, I'm drifting, I'm drifting, I'm drifting. So I would have one pupil that way and one pupil that way, which as weird as that seems, is not really what they were going for. And I couldn't adjust because I had finger extensions on. So the director would yell like action and the um, assistant makeup person would come in, stick a finger in my eye, turn the lens and go. And then we played the scene. So <laughs> that was fun. You know, um, oh, the time I was playing a zombie, yay, on, um, what was it, Death Valley. Um, I was just like one of the 17 million zombies there. I had half a face of prosthetic, something like across my face like that. And I had a sneezing fit in the middle of the night. And I was like, uh, I'm just like sneezing so much here that I don't want to see what is stuck under this side of the prosthetic <laughs> and <You're> I'm, contributing. <laughs> I'm contributing I was so sorry for the makeup guy you had to take it off at the end of the night because I, I, hi sorry <laughs> <laughs> what are you gonna do um oh I had I had an alert it wasn't an allergic reaction it was just a reaction to some specially fixed stuff we used on one of my films um, it sort of like got out of the bowl that it was on or something like that and got on to me and I was like immediately red and swollen and whatever so much so that I had to be taken to the hospital. That was fun. It was gone by the time we got there, but you know, these things happen. Um, I've had so much prosthetic work done that I've, that I've forgotten most of it. You know, I have obviously pictures on Facebook and everything like that, but it's like, whenever I sit down for a new project and they're like, have you done this before? And I'm like, yeah, a couple of times. <laughs> uh, the latest one for my commercial, which hopefully will come out next week, next month, which is the same thing. Um, that was about four or five hours. That was a full on wig. That was full on white makeup. That was full on effects makeup. I'm um, not prosthetics except for over there. Um, I can't really say more about that because that's also not NDA. Um, but hopefully the damn thing will come out next month because we've been waiting for it. Um, that was so much fun to do. You know, um, I didn't get some of the glue out of my hair for like a month after we shot that though. So that was, yeah, it was like, what is behind oh yeah that's what it is <laughs> where's my scissors I did actually get to the point where I cut a bit out of my hair because it was like this is too much now um oh and that other film I shot where I was a witch where we where we shot at about 3 a.m in the morning so whatever the hell they'd put in my hair to make it look all greasy it was cold it was freezing in my hair and little bits were starting to break off you know, oh. which is like, yay! You know. You're always contributing to the look. <laughs> <laughs> which is the worst experience, having the prosthetics uh, put on or them take, taken off? Um, it's usually being taken off. Um, like the one that took five hours, um, that had to take it off with alcohol, which was fine. You know, you always, you know, do that. Um but it was a full, full, full face prosthetic. So by the time you got to halfway, that with the alcohol painted on underneath to like get it up, every time it would come back down to get more supplies, it was impossible to breathe just because of the alcohol smell. So that was a bit much. Then there was the time I was shooting something out in, I don't know, 
Palmdale or somewhere like that, but it was about two or three hours out of LA. I had a race back to do a play reading that I was in and I didn't have time to take makeup off. So the entire drive back from Palmdale, I was like taking these boils and pus covered things on my face because I was a plague victim. I was like scratching them off and like rubbing them off and throwing them out the window so that by the time I got back to LA, I was like fairly presentable. That was interesting. Oh, and yeah, in uh, Florida, when I was shooting Agoraphobia, um, amazing makeup for the ghost. Amazing. She used like coffee grinds and everything, but then she left before we wrapped and I was left with the makeup on. Really? And really, <laughs> really. So that was also interesting, you know, all right, like, okay, I'm wrapped now and what, she's not here. So what do I do? Um... You know, all these things happen all the time. Oh, I've had full body paint on. That took about six hours to do it. When I say full body paint, I mean full body paint for, what was it, Curtain. It was a short film, Curtain, um, written, directed by Dennis Woodmeyer and Kevin Kolsch, later to do, Starry Eyes, later to do, Pet Cemetery, who I really hope I can work with again sometime in the future. Um, but if you can track down Curtain, it was about a succubus stuck in the bathroom like centuries until somebody has a shower and lets it free um all i'm saying is i did a lot of of sitting on um sinks and in baths and shower things it was so much fun yes i'm gonna find that that's something that i'm <laughs> very interested in. <laughs> you mentioned agoraphobia we just had loose uh simone on uh the director uh, was that your first time uh, working with her it was. Um, so far, it is also the only time. Oh, yeah. um, but hopefully we can work together in the future as well. I love working with Lou. Amazing. And I had such a wonderful scene with Tony Todd in mm -hmm. Agoraphobia. We sort of like... Mm -hmm. rah, rah, rah. Um, it was really, really cool to work with him and Cassie. Cassie's adorable. Um, so that was... It, it was a long, hard fight to get that out in, yeah. in the U.S. But I'm glad it's finally out. I am. Um, are there any movies that um, that you would consider underappreciated that you've been in that you would like people to check out? <laughs> All of them. <laughs> <laughs> this is yeah. like B-horror that we're talking about after all, isn't oh. it? So everything's underappreciated. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you like Giallo, and I mean like original Giallo, like original Suspiria and things like that not sort of the second but definitely not the third in the Mother's Trilogy then you should find and watch um, Mark of the Witch not the original, the one that I'm in mm -hmm. um, I loved Mark of the Witch it's one of the favorite films, my favorite films that I've been in um, people either love it or absolutely fucking hate it and like what the fuck is this but if you have the appreciation for that giallo for that over-the-top italian opera with effects and colors and everything watch it um what else obviously i spit in your grave deja vu that's another thing that everyone loves or hates you know trophy heads people love trophy heads um underappreciated is ravenwolf towers also from uh uh, Charles Band and, and um, Full Moon. Um, that was that was very similar, yet obviously not the same, to um, American Horror Story um, Season Hotel. You know, again, one of these live-in hotels downtown Los Angeles where people are missing and blood and gore and whatnot. You know. Um, what else? What else? What else? Vile comes up every so often. Um, torture porn, sort of, kind of, but different. Oh, super torture porn, if you can find it, is um, Shelter, S-H-E-L-L-T-E-R. Um, very underrated, very raw film, very extreme film. Okay, that one was my third film. Um, Sam Hell, if you can track that down on YouTube, my God, it's there. It's a really well done film that because the producers had a fight, never got distribution. So eventually they agreed it could be stuck on YouTube. It's really good. 
that was my first film. Um, but you can hardly ever find it because it's in the caverns of YouTube somewhere, you know. Um, most everything I've been in, <laughs> gore orphanage, you know, really strong story, period film in an actual 100-year-old house. Um, not many people know about it. I, I don't even know if it's out there anymore because it was distributed through Family Video, which has since died a horrible death, you know, way down in Chinatown that got out for a few months and it came right back in because, again, there was some issue with distribution. You know, that's a weird film if you've ever seen it, but it's a strong film and it's an interesting film, you know. Um, find what you can. <laughs> Here he is. Uh, Trish, do you have another question? I, it's not a question. I have a comment for you, Maria. So I just want you to know how beloved you are. So many people reached out when they knew that you were going to be our guest today to say, oh my gosh, I love Maria. She's so great. I love working with her. An overwhelming amount of people. So I, you have just an impeccable reputation and um, for obvious reasons. Thank you so much. I try not to uh, annoy anyone on set. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Well, that's always good in those too. <laughs> yeah, just like mind your own business. Don't fall on your face. Learn your lines and like, you know, be ready to go. <laughs> All right. Very good. Well, this has been great. It was good to have you back on and we should do this again sometime. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you so much again for having me, you guys. And yeah. uh, I guess I should ask if people would like to follow you, where can they, not back to your home or anything, but. Uh, oh, thank God. Online, where can, where can they um, I have my Facebook page, um, Maria Olson. I am um, on Instagram, not so much lately because I haven't been shooting. I used to like post pictures and whatnot of what I've been shooting. Um, again, Maria Olson 66 on Instagram. I'm on Twitter, but not really. Because I don't know, Twitter's like this this whirlpool. <laughs> yeah, I'm not a big fan either. <laughs> yeah, um, but mainly it's Facebook. A lot of my stuff's on Facebook. If you go to my Facebook page, there's like a ton of albums um, of my films, photo albums, and they each have like links to where you can find the film or, so, or things like that. So that's actually a great source of information. Very good. And uh, Catherine Capazzi says, uh, "Enjoyed the interview. It was awesome." Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Catherine. Yay. And we'll see everybody soon. Thank you again. Bye. Thank you, Maria. You're welcome. Thank you. All right. Take care. You too.